Hi guys and welcome back. So the intention of the provisional government was the organization of elections to the Russian Constituent Assembly. And the provisional government lasted approximately eight months and ceased to exist when the Bolsheviks gained power after the October Revolution in 1917. But how effective was the provisional government during its short time in existence? Firstly, I want to recap events leading to the abdication of the Tsar and the establishment of the provisional government. Now, we've already considered the factors which forced the Tsar to abdicate, including long-term long underlying causes such as the disparity between the very rich and the very poor, and also short-term factors such as the First World War. And the March Revolution, as it became known, of 1917 involved multiple strikes across Russia, um, including one large one um, at the Putilov Steelworks in Petrograd, which culminated with the military siding with the revolutionaries. Industry came to a standstill and two competing governments were established. The Duma set up a provisional committee to take over government. However, demonstrators now joined by soldiers marched to the Duma demanding they take over the government. Reluctantly, Duma leaders accepted. Now they'd always wanted reform rather than the revolution, but now there seemed that they had no choice. On the same day, revolutionaries set up the Petrograd Soviet and began taking control of food supplies in the city. The setups, they set up soldiers committees um, which undermined the authority of the officers and it wasn't clear who was in charge of Russia at this point, but it was obvious that the Tsar was not. The official abdication was announced on the 15th of March 1917. Russia's problems surely should be solved now, shouldn't they? They have rid themselves of the evil autocratic ruler who squandered the country's wealth on his own personal, lavish and luxurious lifestyle, or at least that's what many thought. However, Russia's problems weren't solved by the abdication of the Tsar. The Duma's provisional committee took over government and it faced three overwhelmingly urgent decisions. To continue the war or make peace, to distribute land to the peasants who had already started taking it, I might add, or ask them to wait until elections had been held. And finally, how best to get food to the starving workers in the cities. So how effective was the provisional government? Well, let's explore its weaknesses. The first thing is that it was unelected and therefore seen as dictators dictatorial. Um, the provisional government was formed on the 1st of March 1917 and it was meant to be a temporary body that would govern Russia in place of the Tsar until elections could be held. Now unlike the Petrograd Soviet, the provisional government was unelected. Many saw it as a dictatorial body um, of upper class citizens and Prince Lvov was its prime minister and you can see him behind me. Elections were delayed and the provisional government was in power until later that year. Now, the provisional government was a mixed group. While it included men such as the lawyer Alexander Kerensky, who was also justice minister in the provisional government, but a respected and a respected member of the Petrograd Society, it also included angry revolutionaries who had no experience of the government at all. The provisional government took major decisions. It um, promised Russia's allies that it would continue the war while trying to settle the situation in Russia. It also urged the peasants to be restrained and wait for elections before taking any land. The idea was that the provisional government could then stand down and allow free elections to take place to elect a new constituent assembly, i.e. a new government that would fairly and democratically represent the people of Russia. It was a very cautious message for a people who had just gone through a revolution. And both these key de decisions greatly affected the Russian people because this made the government, uh, and as, as a result, this made the government increasingly unpopular and provided ammunition for revolutionaries who called for its dissolution, i.e. to stop it, to close it down. Now, a second weakness um, 
of the provisional government, or at least a second element that was causing problems, was the establishment of Soviets. Now, additionally, the provisional government was not the only possible government, because after the February Revolution, the first Soviet was established in Petrograd, called the Petrograd Soviet. And soon Soviets had been elected in Moscow and other cities. And the Soviets were councils elected by workers, soldiers and sailors. And they were usually chaotic, rowdy and a bit disorganized, but they were elected unlike the provisional government. And this gave them greater legitimacy in some aspects than the provisional government. Aside from the provisional government then, most workers paid close attention to the Petrograd Soviet. The Soviet had the support of workers in key industries such as coal, mining and water, and the support of much of the army as well. Now, the existence of both the provisional government on the one hand and the Petrograd so uh, Soviet on the other meant that power was shared in something known as dual power. And the Petrograd Soviet accepted that the provisional government would make decisions for Russia until elections could be held. The existence of two political bodies, though, increased the potential for political disagreement. And this was especially the case as the two bodies held very different views. The provisional government consisted mainly of those who wanted moderate, minimal changes to the government of Russia, whereas the Petrograd Soviet was made up of those who wanted to give power to the working class um, and who had more revolutionary and radical ideas. However, the two did cooperate for a time. Yet one man was determined to push the revolution even further. And here we come to our third weakness of the provisional government, and that is the appeal of the Bolsheviks. Now, what this one man I'm talking about was Lenin, leader of the Bolsheviks. And when he heard of the March revolution, he immediately returned to Russia from exile in Europe. The Germans even provided him with a special train because they were hoping that he might actually cause more chaos in Russia. And when Lenin arrived at Petrograd station, he set out the Bolshevik program in his April thesis. And he urged people to support the Bolsheviks in a second revolution. Now the thesis was a program calling for Soviet, e.g. Um, the, the, the Petrograd Soviets, control of state power. And he urged the Bolsheviks to withdraw their support from the provisional government and to call for the immediate withdrawal from World War I and for the distribution of land amongst the peasantry. And the Bolshevik party was to organize workers, soldiers and peasants and to strengthen the Soviets so that they could eventually seize power from the provisional government. So why would the Bolsheviks have been a popular option for the Russian people in 1917? Well, firstly, Lenin's slogans, peace, land and bread and all power to the Soviets contrasted sharply with the cautious message of the provisional government. It also implied that the Soviets should govern Russia in place of the provisional government. And this became an extremely effective Bolshevik rallying cry. So firstly, we have part of the slogan, peace. And this is very um, sharply contrasted with the provisional government, if you remember, that is going to continue the war. So we have ending the war versus continuing the war. And support for the Bolsheviks increased quickly, particularly in the Soviets and in the army, because the Russian people wanted the war to come to an end. However, the provisional government decided to continue Russia's involvement, and they feared that foreign investment from Britain and France would cease in the event of a Russian withdrawal. So in March 1917, the Petrograd Soviet declared that it would no longer support an offensive war against Germany. However, the provisional government persisted with military campaigns and in the second half of 1917, the provisional government's authority steady, steadily collapsed. The war effort was failing, soldiers had been deserting and thousands from the army. And as you'll see here, in June 1917, so Alexander Kerensky, who is now Minister of War, ordered the June Offensive of 1917, an attempt to push the Austrians back. 
and it was a disaster. The army began to fall apart in the face of a German counterattack. The deserters decided to go home. The soldiers became more receptive to Bolshevik propaganda and the loyalty of a number of units to the provisional government was now incredibly uncertain. Now the provisional government's problems got even worse in the summer because in July 1917, um, Bolshevik-led protests against the war turned into a rebellion known as the July Days. However, when Kerensky produced evidence that Lenin had been helped by the Germans, support for the rebellion did fall, and Lenin in disguise had to flee to Finland. Kerensky then used troops to crush the rebellion and took over the government. Now, Kerensky was still in a very difficult situation because the upper and middle classes expected him to restore order. By this time, however, real power lay with the Soviets, especially the Petrograd Soviet. It had a Bolshevik majority, and um, which means that the majority of the members were um, Bolshevik supporters. And they also had a Bolshevik chairman, Leon Trotsky, who you've come across before. And it also had the support of much of the army and all industrial workers. So a huge varying range of support. Okay, so now looking at the second appealing aspect of Lenin's policy, um, land. Now we're gonna compare what the provisional government did with this policy. Because desertions from the army were made even worse because another element of the provisional government's policy had failed. The government did not solve the land issue in the countryside and the desire of peasants for control of more land was not met. The peasants ignored the orders of the government to wait, and they were simply taking control of the countryside left, right and center. And the soldiers who were mostly peasants didn't want to miss their turn when the land was shared out. As a result, seizures of land from landowners became widespread and the continuing economic crisis discredited the provisional government and strengthened the appeal of the Bolsheviks. And thirdly, we come to bread. Now, while these events were happening amongst the political rulers and the army, there was also little reason for the ordinary people of Russia to be grateful to the provisional government. Because as one contemporary writer documents, cabs and horse-drawn carriages began to disappear. Streetcar service was erratic. The railway stations filled with trams and deserting soldiers, often drunk, sometimes threatening. The police force had vanished in the first days of the revolution. Now revolutionary order was over and holdups and robberies became the order of the day. Politically, signs of chaos were everywhere. So we can just see there the extent of issues that are resonating amongst the population. Economic difficulties had, major, had played a major role in Nicholas II's fall from power. And now the provisional government had very limited success in dealing with these exact same problems. The prices of goods continued to increase. Food was in short supply. Fuel shortages made living conditions unbearable, especially during the harsh Russian winter, which is winters which were freezing cold. And the government could not guarantee enough grain, ammunition or weapons for troops fighting in the war. So again, we have economic problems contributing to um, greater resentment of the provisional government and greater support for the um, Bolsheviks. Finally, we have the Kornilov revolt. Now others were also fed up with the provisional government. And in September, 1917, the army leader, General Kornilov marched his troops to, towards Moscow, intending to get rid of the Bolsheviks and the provisional government and restore order back to the old order when the Tsar was in power. And Kerensky was in an impossible situation. He had some troops who supported him, but they were no match for Kornilovs. And so Kerensky had to turn to the only group which could save him. And these were his Bolshevik opponents you see here, who dominated the Petrograd Soviet. The Bolsheviks organized themselves in an army which they called the Red Guards. And Kornilov's troops refused to fight members of the Soviet. So Kornilov's plans collapsed. 
But it was hardly a victory for Kerensky, because in fact, by October, Kerensky's government was doomed. It had tried to carry on the war and failed. It had therefore lost the army's support. It had tried to stop the peasants from taking over the land and so lost their support too. Without peasant support, it had failed to bring food into the towns and food prices had spiraled upwards. This had lost the government any support from the urban workers, from the workers in the cities. So in contrast, the Bolsheviks were promising what the people wanted most, bread, peace and land. And it was the Bolsheviks who had removed the threat of Kornilov. By the end of September 1917, there were Bolshevik majorities in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets and in most of Russia's other major towns and cities. <laughs> 